So I want to welcome everybody. Hello. Good morning. Thank you so much for showing up today. What today shows me is, is there is a, there are a lot of people in our communities that really do care about our environment. Um, here at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Fort Myers, our social justice team has teamed up with All Face Church Climate Action Team, and uh, so that's a little partnership happening. And our social justice team here also has taken on creating a community with the Pachamama Alliance. So the Pachamama Alliance of Southwest Florida is part of a much bigger vision to engender, nurture, and inspire activists to work for an environmentally sustainable, socially just, spiritually fulfilling world. So we need to change the dream, right? And so out of us getting together in these Pachamama meetings, a number of us saw that one of the biggest solutions that we could all work on was going solar in Southwest Florida. And we also saw there's really a need to bring our different environmental groups together, to work together. So. Out of that conversation, only three weeks ago, this event was put together. And so we have uh, eight partners here. I want to make sure I don't forget them, so let me bring this up. Well, I mentioned All Face Unitarian uh, Congregation Climate Action Team. Audubon of Southwest Florida is a co-sponsor today. The Pachamama Alliance, as I have mentioned. The Calusa Sierra Club, we're happy to see a number of you here today. And I think that's how we got Clifford. Thank you for coming. And I think Bruce put some information over there on the information table. So check it out. The Calusa Nature Center, and we have Bill Hammond here today. And I think the rest of the staff over there is pretty busy. So they would be here. Um, Happahatchee Center has also put their weight behind this. Our church, social justice and the League of Women Voters. So hopefully this is the beginning of partnership and coalition building and educating each other and lifting each other up into positive action here in Southwest Florida. I, I think this is just the beginning of a, an idea of a series of speakers, especially um, gleaning some of the wisdom of those of us and I'm, the, I'm saying us, but I'm probably the youngest in this group of elders here, um, that have a lot of experience with organizing and with working for the environment. So that's all I'm going to say right now. I, it is a big welcome. I want to tell you about an action at the end of this called the Nehemiah Action, an organization called LIFE, which is a coalition of churches that are working for justice. Um, but without any further ado, I'm going to give this microphone to Ensign. I know he's very shy. And then we're going to watch a film, and Clifford's going to take us through that. So this is Ensign Cowell. Hi. And we're partners in this. Yes, you bet. And that's been one of the most joyous things, to work together with Holly and Gary Robbins on, on this project. And, and Joan Marshall, our chair from All Face of the Climate Action Team. I want to ask you a couple questions, just to sort of get a feel and insight into the audience. How many feel you're at least somewhat familiar with solar, with, um, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Got hold it right up there. Um, with uh, solar heating and solar power. Okay, good, good. And, and you sort of figure people that come to this are, are already somewhat familiar. Um, how many are pretty familiar with the economics of solar power installation? installation? Okay, a little less. And I think you're going to get some, and that certainly at the end, uh, Clifford is going to answer questions for us to give us real insight into that. How many are you basically pro-solar, especially for this, the Sunshine State? <laughs> I'm wrong. <laughs> I know. I'm, 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 a, I'm a carpet bagger from Ohio, and I am stunned at the lack of progress in solar power in, in, in Florida. Amen. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, do you think, uh, show of hands, is our federal government basically pro-solar as a good means of adding to and or replacing our existing electric power generation? No. no. They are for the military. 
Certain places they yes. are. Yeah, I don't think the federal government is necessarily against it, but they certainly haven't been as big a booster as they could be. How many of you feel you have a good idea of how we should help in influencing the advancement of solar power generation in Florida? Want to help? Good, because that's what we need. We need to help promulgate, uh, push it out. Our hopes and expectations for this session are many of you will become even more engaged in environmental activism. If solar is your particular interest, we're going to try and coalesce and have an, uh, you know, a group that goes on to help uh, in the advancement of solar. As the last question, how many think that climate change is a reality? <laughs> how many think the worldwide, the worldwide ecosystem is in some peril? Yeah. Oh, so um, let me just give you just a tiny bit of background on myself. Um, I worked for two Fortune 500 companies. I worked on the North Slope pipeline financing for the Standard Oil Company, which is original John D. Rockefeller Company in Cleveland. My two brother-in-laws were senior finance executives for Exxon. So I'm, and I own a fossil fuel investments in my IRA. So I want to be truthful. I come from a big fossil fuel background. <laughs> but fossil fuels, I know, are limited. We don't know if they're 50, 100 years, or 200 years, but they're definitely very limited. And the problem with fossil fuels, you bring them out, there's a lot of environmental disturbance, there's CO2 and methane emissions, there's lots of issues with using fossil fuels, even aside from the CO2 emissions themselves when we, when we utilize it. And we know the issues with plastic and its non degradability and all the kind of problems that has. Um, so we have to move to a post corporate economy, and I think that's really among people that are not politically, um, you, know, merit, you, you know, you have a litmus test of of politics, and you can't believe it, but we have to move to a post urban economy, a positive fossil fuels economy. And I think there's some all things we can do. Each of us can have a tagline on our email. Mine is uh, uh, climate is changing, why are we? Climate change is not a hoax. But I don't care what you put on your email, but if you show everyone where you stand and what you believe, I think that's the thing. If we go to paper straws, Rather than plastic straws, there's a movement now, I see at the golf course about, you know, they're saying don't take these things and don't use them. There's a lot of other things. One I just thought of recently, I was in my icebox, I was reading, go to a vegetable-based uh, uh, milk products. You know, like almond milk or other soy milk or that kind of stuff. And the importance of that, let me tell you, as, a, as an economics and investment person, you send a signal to the marketplace. We've seen it with gluten. There's a very small population of people are allergic to gluten, but the marketplace moves along in a massive way because it sees those signals at the market. So I encourage everybody to do little things, little things mean a lot. Um, our presenter today is Clifford Mitchell. Clifford, I have come to know a little bit in the last few weeks. Lovely person. He's a member of the Coastal Sierra Club and on their executive committee. Like many of us, he was environmentally conscious for many years. But he's become very active, especially in environmental, and a proponent of solar power in our region. He is part of a company named Crew, which consults on and facilitates solar installations. He has a degree in aerospace engineering, and has spoken to many groups about the financial economics, the technical feasibility, and the environmental benefits of installing solar power, both individually and in microgrids. As many of you may know, the Sierra Club has been working on a national program to have as many U.S. cities as possible commit to a pathway to 100% renewable power generation, and Orlando and St. Pete in, in, in Florida have already done that. I think you'll find this film engaging and challenging, and most importantly, it shows the positive opportunity for jobs and economic stimulus in transitioning to solar and other forms of renewable electric power generation. I think a lot of people miss this. This is a real opportunity. Like we're talking about infrastructure development, it's the same kind of thing. Transition to different power and doing environmental things can be very economically stimulant. It's not a downer. <laughs> I've said enough. Clifford, take it, man. Yes, uh, I'm going to keep mine short because I'm going to be around for a question and answer period after the film. So I thank you all for coming out. Um, solar energy, renewable energy has been a passion of mine. And it's always been inherent in all that I've done since graduating school and the recent activism I've been doing has been showing such great fruit and brought me to 
to meet so many wonderful people, so many energized people, and so many people working for a change. So all of you coming together to help facilitate that, get more information, go forth to the world, and talk to more people and get them involved is critical in how we get this movement going. Our whole emphasis when Jones first sat down with me is to prime the ground. We want to turn our city council's hearts, ears, and minds to using renewable energy so that they can move forward and join the other cities a part of the Ready for 100 campaign that Sierra Club has already instituted so we can hand it off to them and let them run with the national focus on it. So with that in mind, we'll go ahead and start the film. Thank you all for coming out. And we'll go ahead and have refreshments and food after the film. Outstanding, outstanding. Everybody enjoy the movie? Yeah! yeah. Oh, good to hear, good to hear. Mitchum, M-I-T-C-H-U-M. Mitchum. 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 Like the deodorant, but with a E instead of a U. And Clifford, like the big red dog, except I'm tall, black, and handsome. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Alright, so we're getting everything set up for, come on, turn on, there we go, for the grub, so we'll go ahead and do that, but, uh, but while we're getting set for that, I'll go ahead and touch base with you all on some of the things that I've been working on and focused on, uh, aside from just being an activist for solar, I've actually also been up to do some lobbying work with another organization called Rethink Energy Florida. And we just recently went up to Tallahassee to talk to our legislators to go ahead and have, ahead and have them ban fracking. So once we remove the incentive to continue with the fossil fuel economy and the carbon-based economy, the world will be, and the country will be more open to a solar-based economy. So keep that in mind as we do everything, because everything we do here reverberates out to everyone around us and everyone else that sees it. So that way we can go ahead and prime the ground, so that way the politicians and the legislators will follow suit and actually become that group that is also incentivized by renewable energy. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and start this, start this time. We'll get through in about five minutes. And just to let you know the efforts that we were finishing up over in Tallahassee, the main thing we were calling for was to hear the fracking bill uh, in the Agricultural and Preservation Committee. They actually were very reluctant before we got there, but after we left that day, they heard the bill, they scheduled it for that following Monday, and the bill passed. So we've got some movement. It passed the committee. It passed the committee. Yeah, I got a little ahead of myself. But hey, we're happy to get it that far. We're good, we're good. But you know, we just need to keep that momentum. So everything that we can do to support that, continue to do that. Uh, talk to your legislators. Uh, first things first is speaking with the legislators. Making sure that your senators and your representatives know to support that bill. It's amazing how much impact you actually have with just a phone call and a handwritten letter. Uh, they were giving us the numbers and saying that a phone call is 50% effective, a uh, copied email is only about 1% effective, a copied letter is about 70% uh, effective, but an actually handwritten letter, I want to say was 80 or 90% effective. Don't quote me on those exact numbers, but it, the point of that statement is the impact of actually a handwritten unique letter. I mean, you can have the same gist if you get together with a letter writing, letter writing campaign, but make it unique. Sure. Uh, I thought the, right now I've been getting uh, notices from uh, Progress of Florida to get in touch with Corcoran. He's the guy who, is he the block? Is he the block uh, right now? Or what's He's the happening? speaker. Yeah, I know he is. Yeah. And is he the one holding things up? Oh, is he the block? No. It's actually in committee and has to be heard on the floor before Corcoran even really gets into the game. I forget what committee is moved to. I think it's the appropriations committee that it has to go into next before it's actually heard on the floor. Once it reaches the floor, Corcoran... Who's in the appropriations committee? I do not know off the top of my head. But you can, you can go through the representative's website for the state and they'll let you know that. What can you say about Arcadia Power? Arcadia Power is actually a company that is endorsed by the Sierra Club. How Arcadia Power works is, and electricity doesn't care where it comes from. All right? it's, it's independent. Once the electrons are moving, they don't mind if they came from a solar panel, wind turbine, coal, natural gas, or whatnot. What Arcadia Power does is they use the funds that they're provided to them to finance renewable energy, particularly wind turbines, in the Midwest. I believe Iowa is, their, is where the main hub is. But what it does is it offsets your electricity bill 
for what you can give to them. It's a great alternative for people that are renting or that don't have the ability to use solar power. Now, uh, I haven't worked with the company directly, but I know that they are recognized by the Sierra Club, so I mean, their work goes a long way as far as I'm concerned. But it can go up to half of your bill and with no additional charge. If you want to do 100%, there is a premium that's added to it, so your bill goes up by 1%, 2%, something to that effect, and that's used to finance greater endeavors. Well, I have two questions. Um, how polluting is the manufacturing of solar panels? The manufacturing of solar panels is polluting because you have to go with the idea you have to break an egg to make an omelet. Yeah. Uh, it's less than if we use fossil fuels, but the key about it, if all things being the same, after the panel's produced, it's no longer creating pollution. Right. All right, so it's not necessarily the manufacturing. It's not, there's not a, a big argument there because we just say, hey, even if it's less than what conventional fuels are using, that what happens after the fact, even if they were equal to conventional, after the fact, burning natural gas is still polluting and it's, t it's argument goes between four and 40 times more damaging to the ozone layer than just burning coal. So that continuous aspect is what makes solar panels more advantageous. Perfect. Second question. My uh, second one. Um, how hard are the panels to keep clean once you have them on your roof? Mm. The panels generally should be cleaned six months to once a year, depending on where you're at. In Florida, for the most part, we get a lot of rain, so the panels stay pretty clean. Uh -huh. However, there is some pollen that can accumulate, and then that pollen combines with the water, it turns into a glaze or a muck that should be taken care of. And really, you just look at your production. So once the panels are on the roof and you see your production diminishing, mm. it's, it's time to get them clean. It doesn't clean. get like algae growing on it or anything like that? <clears throat> Not particularly. No, it's, it's generally too hot because it's on the roof or exposed. So algae doesn't like that. It likes cool, dark places. Uh, Ruth. Um, yes, can you tell us, um, do you know what percentage of solar energy the state of Florida currently produces? About 1%. They group all the renewable and alternative fuels into one category, and it's 1%. In the entire state of Florida, there's about 15,000 solar installations. Just give you an idea, that number sounds high, right? 15,000? Uh, the state of New Jersey has 48. Yeah, and they produce 80% more solar energy. Please, please go ahead and get food even while you're here. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. So, food is ready. We've got that. Um, I have read that there are several energy companies petitioning state legislatures not to require them to buy back the surplus energy. Yes. Where does Florida stand on that? Florida does not have any contention on the net metering as of right now. There are several states, Minnesota and Arizona in particular, and, Los and Nevada, have put in efforts to end net metering. What net metering is, the extra energy that your solar panels produce goes to the utility company, and the utility company, since they didn't have to produce that, they compensate you for the energy that you produced. That's, that's what net metering is. In Florida, it doesn't amount to a lot. It comes down to less than a nickel per watt when you're actually paying about 10 and a half cents uh, per kilowatt. So the amount isn't a lot, but over a year it could be a couple hundred in comparison to a system. Now there aren't any specific attacks in Florida, but there have been in other states. And personally, the benefit of producing your own energy and the distributed power that comes from solar, I think outweighs the net metering amount. So I don't really think that's a, a big argument that I would even put up with. I'd much rather see more solar. One other quick question if I might. How far are we from Actually, it, it has to be relative to storage. How far are we to competitive energy, solar, when companies that will compete with the FPLs of the world? The energy is already reached what's called the red parity. So it's essentially one to one. Or it'll be like one, maybe a 10% higher, depending on when you maybe 10% lower. So it's essentially one to one. Storage is another augmenter. Storage actually can cost as much as the system itself. Now that storage, how far away are we from storage being more affordable? I've heard three to five years for the last two years. So, <laughs> so it's becoming more and more. Do you uh, see that is, ever happening? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Will, will the FPLs of the world go solar by the time we can build competitive? The funny thing is, FPL is actually the largest solar utility in the state of Florida and is a leader and you nationally. Them as an example. Yes, as an example. So, but but the, I put that perspective. They're do, they're embracing a lot of solar, but they want it to be them controlling the solar right. more than anything. To have storage capacity to do that, it's a matter of. Uh, the the funds that somebody has available to get into storage because it can be like I said as much as the system itself. Now if the system has gotten it no cost out of you, no chain, to invest some money into storage may be a better option. But overall, just getting the panels and worrying about storage later is a much more effective route to go because if you're even if you don't have storage, that's still one home less that is polluting to that. And it actually helps everyone else's power go down because the peaker plants that are turned on to produce that more energy don't have to be turned on. Yes, Bill. Yeah, I think the third question, uh, my understanding is solar power lights invested quite a bit in the battery storage systems for the Arcadia solar fields. You know, and they're committed to 21 solar fields over the next three years. Uh, so there's been a there's been a real tip in solar power lights in just the last few years, and the Arcadia plant. Uh, was the first big one, and that triggered Kitson's at Babcock Ranch. And between those two, the cost of solar panels went down so far, when Florida Power Light looked at buying a million of them in one shot, that they committed to 20 more solar fields in the next three years, uh, between the east and west coast of Florida. But uh, just as you said, storage of, you know, you produce that electricity during the day, can you store to produce during the night? And that's what they're working on right now, and that's that's kind of their test project, that, as I understand it, up in Arcadia, uh, pioneering several different battery systems to store at night. Kitson's looking at that as well. The Kitson model is they use the natural gas coming out of Highway 31, so they can, they can power people at night on gas turbines. Right, and, and that, short -term solution. that's Arcadia the city, not Arcadia Power right. that we just <laughs> mentioned right. there. And Kitson, he is the president of Babcock Ranch, uh, right. Kitson Properties, for that, just in case people didn't know about, uh, about that. So that storage augmentation that they're actually investing in is helping drive down the price for everyone. Now, when it will be ready, I'm, I'm not sure, I can't say. I love, there's a new technology for, uh, for a company called Aquion that actually has a saltwater battery which is far more environmentally friendly than conventional, method, conventional methods, and theirs is rather affordable. For a, to power a home like mine, for my solar panels that are going in, it's only about $10,000, and the system that's going on my home, it would be about 25000 So it's just under half for that. But I'm still working on getting my system together and coming through. Um, I just did listen to a program on Morocco mm -hmm. where they you have a lot of Mm -hmm. solar panels, and they were using oil. Had you heard of that, where they heat the oil up to like 700 degrees, but I don't know where they store that or something. Yeah, uh, her question was, okay, so her question was, oh, before I get to that, I'd first off like to thank the Most High God for having all of you here today. I, I can't believe I didn't start everything off with that because he gives us all the opportunity to do all this, so I wanted to say that. But her question, <laughs> uh, her question was, in Morocco, they're actually using oil and solar panels to heat the oil and then use that to turn a turbine and create their electricity. That's referred to as a solar concentrator. It's another type of solar. You have your solar thermal, which is a solar concentrator is a type of, of solar thermal. The black panels that you see on many rooftops, those are solar thermal also. They're used to generally heat pools, to heat the water that way. Uh, the panels that were referred to in the movie are solar photovoltaic, where they just create electricity. Now, specifically in Morocco, that's an awesome idea. Nevada and California are also doing uh, solar concentrator plants, and the potential that has is tremendous because what they're doing is they're taking a mirror, and you know how when you put the mirror on somebody's face, it gets hot, where that is? They're taking fields of mirrors like that, putting them into a central location that heats up the oil, and, or even in California, I think they have, they're using molten salt. So that heated oil goes through the turbine and spins that. So there's tremendous amounts of power that can be created from that, and in Morocco particularly, they have lots of open space that loves heat. 
So that solar concentrator works fantastically for that production value. Now, conventional solar panels with photovoltaic, they handle heat and they do all right in heat, but they generally don't like heat. They prefer a temperate or moderate environment just because the heat interferes with the wiring and lowers the efficiency to transmit the electricity through it. So a lot, everybody likes to think that solar panels like heat, put them out in the desert. They really don't necessarily like heat. Our temperate climate in Florida works out great because it's generally not too hot. When you get to the 90s and kind of hang out, hang out there, while well, Arizona will get to the hundreds and such. So that actually lowers the efficiency. But with solar panels light, bless you, is light. As long as they have light hitting those panels, you can get an electron flow. It's referred to as the photovoltaic effect. Do you know the number of the House bill, or is it the Senate bill? Uh, Senate Bill 462 okay. is the fracking and, bill. And it's, in, and it's in the Senate now? It's in the Senate now. It came out of the Agriculture Preservation Committee. Their name is longer, but I shortened it down to my head. 462. Thank you. Mm -hmm. do, you do you know about the um, SCCF? Um, website that has a legislative tracker on it. It shows what so the SCCF website has a legislative tracker that follows that bill. And others about that for those concerns. Okay, I can tell you that it's Senator Rob Bradley, Senator um, Antier, never heard, Antier Flores, uh, and the senators Baxley, Ian Benequisto is our senator. Okay. Book race, so we should contact uh, Benequisto. Right. Find who your local senator is. Yeah, um, she's on the Appropriations Committee. On the Appropriations Committee. So yes, and the Appropriations Committee has to pass that to move forward and that should be heard on the floor. I'm going to post in the discussion group uh, for the event here uh, the website you would go to to find out who your legislator is so that way you can find that out. Yes. Clifford, just one thing real quick. And, um, about Amendment 1 in the last election and how Florida had a victorious, you know, result. Yes, yes. And, you know, that, that's what we need to do. Amendment more. 1 actually brought us together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually began my solar career fighting Amendment 1. I started working with getting more solar panel on rooftops in Florida, and right when I got the company started in this area is when the Amendment 1 fight began. What Amendment 1 was going to do was essentially it said that it didn't want somebody's bill to be increased because their neighbor cho chose to go solar, which logically makes sense. However, that's where the sense and logic kind of fell apart because after that, it was the way that they were making sure that a neighbor's bill didn't go up because the other neighbor went for solar was in a very controlled fashion. And the way they were doing it was not supported by supporters, and it was not supported by industry, and the only ones that did support Amendment 1 were people that were masquerading as solar supporters, but were actually special interests for... <laughs> I don't want to call anybody names. Go <laughs> on, they were in the show. Just lay it out there and out yeah. they, they, they were not... That? Yes, and they were actually caught on uh, hot mics and recorded conversations saying that the bill was a complete farce. So I actually helped lead a campaign in this local area to fight Amendment 1 and support Amendment 4, which reduced taxes for commercial buildings to actually have solar power. So Amendment 1 actually failed gloriously with 73% of people being against it. So that way we can uh, promote more solar in our region and after that success yes, and the Sierra Club and uh, climate action team and many of the other groups that are sponsoring the event today were very instrumental in moving that forward. It wasn't just me. I didn't do it by myself. I was one little mighty cog in the wheel to help that out and make sure that that could happen and come to fruition. So one of the big things we also found, we had done a fracking event down in downtown Fort Myers, and Representative Fitzenhagen, Heather Fitzenhagen, came by, and she was speaking with us and saying how what we need to do more to be more effective in banning fracking and getting more solar. The key with anything in this economy, because we are a capitalist system, I personally am not commie red, even though I'm green on the outside, you know, so I'm all for capitalism. But using that idea and that concept is how we're going to make the solar economy come to be. 
when we can show the powers that be that there's money in solar energy, that's how we're going to make success and we're going to get greater progress in baby tracking and the like. Are there any American manufacturers? Uh, yes, there are American manufacturers of solar panels. We actually have one over at Riviera Beach, which is on the East Coast. And that is uh, Solar Tech Universal, wonderful company. I toured their facility, beautiful, clean location. However, to make panels in the United States, it's more expensive because we have labor requirements, we have benefits included, we have a minimum wage, whereas in other countries, they don't have that. So they're able to undercut the price of solar that we're able to make comparable. There's about, I think, two other manufacturers, one up in uh, Wisconsin or Ohio, that also manufacture solar panels, but the cost effectiveness hasn't quite been on the same level for that. Yes. Now, the solar tariff is actually a Supreme Court decision that just came down recently that was put forth by Solar World and Sonyva. What they said is those other companies that overseas didn't have the overhead of a domestic company and it was unfair trade wise. And the International Trade, Trade, International Trade Committee agreed with that, and now the president also agreed with that, and he put forth the tariff that's going to put a 30% tariff on the first 500,000 solar panels coming into the country, something to that effect, and it raises after that. Now, what that essentially does is it forces an increase in solar because the cheap panels, that, or excuse me, the inexpensive panels that we're getting now have to be raised in price to, to match. So it makes it more feasible for domestic manufacturers, but overall, the price savings aren't going to be the same with solar. So if you came late to the game, it's going to be a little more expensive than if you move forward. So that tariff is bittersweet. It's you know sweet for the fact that it pushes and encourages more domestic manufacturing. But it's bitter in the sense that the great low prices we were getting, you know, are going to end up disappearing. Holly? Well, I think you started to ask and answer questions, but please, okay, Mary. What can we in this room do next? What should be our next step as um, individuals and also a coalition of people that want to go forward? Yes. The next step that we all need to do is, first off, talk to our legislators, make sure they are supporting a solar economy, that they're inviting solar jobs and solar business to the area. After that, if we own our home, look at your option of going solar. For many homes, it's, as I mentioned before, reach grid parity. It's the same to use polluting fossil fuels as to use renewable energy. So see what your options are. If you rent your home, or if you don't have the ability to put solar panels on there, look into companies like Arcadia Power. Another company is called Windshare LLC. They have options that can at least offset by, by mitigating some of your electricity you're using now. If you can't go all renewable, at least go partial, you'll do something. So I would say those three things would be the things to look into. Talk to your legislator, find out your solar options. If you don't have the, if you can't, don't have solar options, look into Arcadia Power or Windshare. I am a solar assessment, as a solar advisor, so you can call me up, grab my car, I'll get you all set. Um, there, there are programs, um, I know in Tampa, because my son's looking into it, where they come and figure out how much you're paying per month, and they assess it, and they'll put solar panels on there, so you can go solar, and you pay them the same amount of money you would pay the oil, the other company, and then it's paid off within 15 years. Correct. But, you want to, but my concern is in 15 years, the technology is going to change so much that in 10 years, you may have a different right? Um. Okay, Expo. Now, what she had mentioned is there are solar companies that will come by, do an assessment for your home, see how much energy that you're using, see how much solar it will take to use a portion, produce a portion of your electricity, or even take care of 100% of the electricity. That's what my company does. We're one of those that do that. And what we do, like my home, we're going to be able to take 110% of the power I'm currently using and get that with solar. So that's no charge to do that assessment. Somebody like myself will come by and get that done for you. I highly encourage it. The key about that is that it is virtually the same thing that you'd be paying. So you can end up replacing your electricity with solar energy. So that's one of the best routes that somebody can do. Because your system then becomes a, a testament to your commitment to renewable energy. 
So now the follow-up to that was, you're worried about the technology you know, becoming outdated in 10 to 15 years because the systems, they're financed. So instead of paying your electricity bill, you're paying for the financing agreement, which you'd be paying the same amount anyway. And the key about it is the system's gonna run and operate for 25 to 30 years. So if you're paid off in 15, you have 15 years of no electricity bill for a 30 year life. All right, so that number one, I think is a better, better benefit than worrying about the advancement of technology. Number two, after the 30 years, I'm sure technology will advance beyond the point where it, that system's gonna be able to be replaced and updated. But the key is for those 15 years that the system's paying off, you're not polluting. For those 15 years that the system is already paid off, again, you're not polluting. So the environmental impact as far as a reduction in pollutants is more advantageous than trying to have the latest and greatest technology. Because even solar panels themselves, they have evolved and changed, but the production is still roughly the same. The efficiency of the solar panel is going to be between 15 and 17 percent for most panels. That 15 to 17 percent has been around for several years. The biggest advancement in panels is that they're using less materials. So they get the same effect, they're using half as much silicon, or a quarter of the silicon they did with older panels. So the energy production is still there, whether the panels 10 years ago up to today for the most part, it just matters the panels themselves are using less material. So it's not a huge difference in something that you have to really worry about. Yeah. Uh, we had someone come to our home and they were a representative of a solar Investment isn't matching up to what their retirement lifestyle will match up. Uh, so, would her efforts be better utilized using solar on her home or looking to public utilities to encourage them to use solar power, choosing a program that the utility has for that solar energy? Or the government. Or the government. So, I would answer that question in saying this I don't know what that assessment said for your home, but if you're paying the same amount, you're getting a solar system and the same amount is being spent either way. So it would be better to get solar for your home. If you're going to be out of that home or away from that home beyond that, you're leaving a solar home for the next person. So I would say from that standpoint. And unless you were giving extra money than you're already paying currently for the public utility to go solar, you can do that anyway. So you can still go solar and encourage your public utility or the government to go solar energy. But I would say the biggest thing is I would still recommend going solar because you're going to pay the same amount. So why not be more environmentally friendly? And then second, you leave a solar system behind you. And then that way somebody else can you know, get the benefits of that. All right. We'll take out the Connie, then I'll come over to you. Would that raise the value of your home? Oh, will that raise the value of your home? Yes. Solar panels are an improvement, and they have a virtually one-to-one, dollar-for-dollar -one uh, dollar increase in the value of your home. When you add, say, $25,000 worth of solar panels, your home value, street value, increases by $25,000. So, and that's recouped when you sell the home, which is another point, that when that home, say, it's sold to somebody else, it sells at a higher price, and then again, that person has a solar home. Uh, um, I was going to ask about the status on uh, wind turbines and wind energy in Florida, but I'll also throw something what you just said. Right. With the panels lasting 25 years, your roof does not. <laughs> you know, yeah. Adjust those points. Right. So to answer the second one first, the roof of a home generally lasts 12 to 15 years. Solar panels last 30 years. Something's got to give. And that's a true statement. The solar panels are flexible enough that they can be removed, let the roof be replaced, and then put the solar panels back on. So that, that's overcome that way. It is generally a fee to have that done, but it's pretty nominal in comparison to that system. And 
winter. Thing. Um, now, I know you used to. I don't know if you still can. Can you get a tax write-off in the state of Florida for installing solar on your home? Uh, it's not in the state of Florida. It's a it's a federal tax write-off on that, right? And that's a solar solar ITC incentive tax um, incentive tax credit. There you go. Or it's not credit, but a rebate program. But yes, so they have that. So to answer your first question was as far as what the options are with wind turbines in Florida. Florida particularly is not a very windy area, so wind turbines, unless they're off the coast, aren't really looked into. It, I would rather see turbines rather than oil rigs or oil platforms. So now, with that in mind, solar, uh, Florida has another option by using tidal power. And that's something that's out of sight. Because the biggest thing is a lot of people complain that they don't want the eyesore, but they'd rather have the oil spill. Don't quite get that, but you know, that's one thing or another. But what, some, what we can look into is technology that actually puts the turbine in the water. So we can look at the inlet that's here for the Caloosahatchee, put a tidal turbine at the bottom of it, and that's gonna produce continuously. You know, using hydro is actually one of the most effective and, and highest producing energy sources when it's available. The main thing about hydro is that it's not available in every location. Using tidal energy from a utility scale is pretty new. So that's something that's coming of age, and that's something that's going to be, needs to be explored more. Yes? Do you know about Collective Sun? This is a, a way that nonprofits can get the tax benefits, the federal tax benefits that they wouldn't otherwise get if they're nonprofit, and they, they share the um, benefit with the Stop with, with right. We said we had heard of collective benefits. I had not heard of it. It's, how, it's a company called Collective Sun. Collective Sun. Out of I, San Diego. Out of San Diego. And it allows nonprofits to collectively group together so they can get federal credits and incentives. I had not heard of a program like that, but there are many programs. I am not the all knowing guru. I'm pretty good, but I'm not the all knowing guru of every program out there. So, Collective Sun. As a nonprofit, definitely a program that you can look into. Main thing is looking at all your options. There's what's referred to as the Desire website, D D S I R E dot org. It's actually run by the University of North Carolina, and they keep track of all of the incentives and all of the grant programs that are available. So it has a database to let you know in what state what is out there. As a state, as Ruth pointed out, Florida doesn't have any benefits as a state. We are, we do have the solar incentive tax credit from the federal program that, that will give 30% of your system back as a credit on your next tax bill. So it's an offset. So if you pay it up front, then they give you it back as far as not offsetting any taxes you earn for the year. The one thing about the solar ITC is you have to have what's referred to as a tax appetite. If you got a refund check, you may not be eligible for the solar ITC. So keep that in mind. That's something that's really overlooked, overpromoted and underlooked at from some solar professionals. So check and see what your situation is, because that's something that could definitely impact the return on investment to push it out of a realm of feasibility for some people. All right, so there's lots of answers. Yep. We live in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Do you have sun? There's sun everywhere, yes. The question isn't about as much enough sun. The question is how much is it going to offset your electricity? You can do that, but your return on investment it may not be the system to pay off. And you know, just looking about how much sun there is. And look at programs that you have available in Ohio. Like New Jersey gets less sun than Florida. We have 266 days of sunlight. And of those days, is of those other uh, 99 days, that's partial sunlight. So as we know, if you don't like the weather, wait 10 minutes, <laughs> it'll come through. So those are the 266 of the most optimum days to get 100% production of, from your solar system, but it gets production on cloudy days. It gets production on break days. The main thing is, as long as the light is coming through, the panels can operate. It's just a matter of how well and how effectively they can operate. But New Jersey is seeing a significant increase in the definite benefit from using, from using solar energy. So I would imagine Ohio would be similar. I haven't studied specifically their numbers, but any little bit that reduces the amount of fossil fuels is a benefit. It's just a matter of if it's beneficial to your wallet. And overall, solar is beneficial for everyone that chooses. 
If you're going down 10% and the system costs you little, it probably is more cost effective to do that. But if it can reduce your that reduce your energy by 50%, you're doing even better. Or if you're in a position where it can reduce your energy 100%, you're doing even better than that. The key is this, what's referred to as the value of the value of solar study that was done in Maine. And what that study found is that just by each home, or just by the homes in that in Maine, it's Maine or Vermont, but it, by the homes using solar energy, it reduces everybody else's energy costs. Because as I said before, the peaker plants that need to be turned on to make sure we have enough electricity throughout, throughout the day don't have to be turned on, or you don't have as, as many that need to be turned on, or they don't need to operate as long. So therefore, that cost to, do those, to operate those peaker plants goes down, so everybody saves. So the more sun that we're using, the lower the energy costs have to be. And then, that also means we, have to, we can do less exploratory drilling. One of the key issues we're dealing with through the Sierra Club is that they're trying to get fracking sites put in in the Everglades. And they're doing exploratory drilling throughout the Everglades. They're doing exploratory uh, sonic, sonic, son, acoustic, what's the word? Seismic bumper buggy testing. <laughs> Seismic bumper buggy testing to see if, see if there's any, res any pools or reserves of oil and natural gas in the Gulf. So if we're using more solar energy, there's less need for those exploratory endeavors. There's less need for fracking materials and fossil fuels, and we all can benefit. So they're getting permission for this from the federal government because those are national. Right. So the federal government is supporting that. It's not that the government is supporting it. They're not stopping it. You know, so the government itself can be indifferent. They have to support it because they have to have permission to do it. Right, but if there's, if nobody has a better idea, that's the only one that's on the table, so they'll go with it. It's not, when you get into the politics of it, we can use all sorts of key words that you know, frame it in one way or another, but overall, the government listens to whoever is talking to them, and money talks. So when a lot of money is going to an area, that's where the most words and the most attention goes to. So the government itself will be, will follow whoever has the money. And traditionally, solar and renewable energy doesn't have the money. But we don't need the government for that. We can do it ourselves. And that will lead them to say, hey, there's money, there's a bunch of people running that way. Let's go ahead and put money towards that and influence them from that standpoint. So that's how we can get back on that. On this matter of fracking, though, I think we should all be very uh, active in uh, arguing against fracking, no matter where it is. But that's a matter of building public buildings. That could be the destruction of our water supply. Yep. It, it is a, it's a terrible danger to Florida, and we just have to keep our hand on that all the time. Absolutely. The gentleman said that we really need to maintain our focus on stopping fracking because that impacts our water. Fracking uses tremendous amounts of fresh, drinkable water just to get the fracking materials to the ground so they can get the natural get the fossil fuel out of it. And then those, that water is not usable again. There's no good way to clean it up or detoxify it to put it back into the ecosystem. And that threatens contamination of our wells and other water sites. And what is going on anywhere is a potential threat to all of us everywhere. And that's a valid point. So what we what do we need to do? Stay involved and get more involved with organizations that are sponsoring this event and you know living the example that we want to see. We have to be the change we want. Also, really quickly, might I add to that in response to this gentleman here and in response to what you just said, Clifford, everybody right now, you need to contact Senator Negron's office. And you need to tell him and urge him to support. The so, urging bill. Senator Negron to support SB 462. Yeah, I think I said 463, didn't I? But SB 462. So call Senator Negron, let him know that. Um, is there any danger of a roof not being able to hold the panels? Is there any danger of a roof not being able to support the solar panels? It's very low. If a roof is not able to support that, that roof is going to have some issues to get with. It's 
the weight that's solar adds to it is distributed over the roof. It's not concentrated in one area. So it's not something that's really going to impact so much the entire home. If the roof is weak in itself and can't do it, the installer's going to know that. And generally during the inspection, they'll be able to see that. If the roof... Right. If, it, if somebody could walk on it, that's actually putting more weight in one spot than the solar panels will that are distributed over there. So they'll, they'll do that during the inspection time. Because if your roof is 15 years old and needs to be replaced, place your roof first. In many cases, particularly because of the hurricane, the roofs should be replaced or all are getting replaced. But obviously that should be looked at. I just had a new roof put on this week. Does that make that the ideal time? Absolutely. The question was, a new roof was just installed on the house. Does that make it the ideal time? And the answer is absolutely. It's the best time to look at it. We have an advantage in many parts of Fort Myers, in the Cape Coral and Lehigh. We don't have lots of shade. We don't have a lot of tall trees that are blocking the sun access for the roof. And most days, it's just the sun beating down on that roof. So installing solar panels on that is it, it's open to most everybody. And the way the solar panels are installed, it does not negate your warranty on your roof. I do know of the some people I've talked to, they're worried about holes being put in the roof or some other damage being do, being done to it. Uh, using a certified installer ensures that that will not happen. Or if by chance, in the small small chance that it does happen the insurance and that company will make sure that you are made whole and that you know you don't have any residual effects of building or the like for it. But most companies have what's referred to as NABSEP certification, North American Board of Certified Electrical Practitioners. And they're a third party, similar to like a Better, better Business Bureau, that ensures that proper standards are maintained and any issues are addressed. So Unless some company is a brand new and you know just came in the carpet bag, you know you you will be protected. I know my company we have insurance that's over and beyond just what the installer provides to ensure that you're protected and you're not going to have any issues. Will the panels actually would they be blocking the sun? Would they actually keep your house cooler? Yes. Awesome. With the panels blocking the sunlight that's coming down to the roof, would that actually cool your home? And the answer is yes. It's not considered a large amount. Some people argue as far as how much it's going to reduce. But the main thing is this, those panels are absorbing that heat and that radiation, not the roof. So it should drop the overall temperature and make it easier to keep the home cool or maintain its warmth. So yes. Um, I've heard estimates saying 5%. I've heard estimates saying 10%. The main thing, whatever percent going solar is you know, better out to go. Many of us live in associ homeowners associations, and is it possible or is it permissible to uh, get the community to put together a cooperative uh, on a site where the whole community would benefit from that instead of putting it on one individual or maybe Ten individual homes within the community, but yet everybody comes benefits from that usage. So the question was, uh, if somebody's in a homeowners association, and since many many of us are in homeowners associations, is there a way that they can collectively start a co-op for the solar panel, or collectively put, put in a solar field that they can utilize that energy? So I would answer that in yes, yes, and yes. Uh, first off. It is illegal for the HOA to stop you from installing solar panels. I say that with an asterisk. I don't want you to go to war with your neighbors. All right? If your neighbors are wholly against solar, even though you could, doesn't mean you should. I never liked them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we have to have that agape love. Love everybody, right? No, so, you know, perfect, thank you. Uh, so, they can't stop you, but obviously you don't want to cause a disturbance. So collectively working together, if one person is going to do it and everybody else thinks it's a good idea, the entire neighborhood <coughs> can start installing solar panels. There's actually a new community built in, being built in Fort Myers off of Summerlin by Health Park called Murata. And they're giving all of those homes the option of having solar panels. They can own them or they can lease them. So I have to stop by that, beautiful homes. It's great. Just as you drive by, you see the solar panels on each of the homes. It's a tremendous idea. So collectively, yes, you can come together. 
I personally, rather than getting a solar field, like if there's a common area that's just an open field, you can put solar panels in that. I personally would rather see solar panels on a rooftop than in a field, because now you have to have ancillary things that go along with that, being greater foundations, you have runoff issues, you have an impact to wildlife, and you have a, a visual impact that some people may not be open to. I think they look cool, but I'd much rather see a lush forest area than a field of solar panels. So if a roof is a better option, going with that. Putting in carports might be a better option as well. Since in many communities, you have, you have parking areas. So if the solar panels can be the coverings for the cars, that works out even better and you don't have as much impact to the environment. The main thing is maintaining our environment as much as we can. That's why we're using renewable energy. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Okay, um, I, I appreciated this um, and it was excellent, but it didn't meet my need. So okay. I'd like to explain to you why it didn't. Tell me your needs, I'll see if I can okay. fit I am a believer in uh, somebody coming up with a model and if that model fits, I adopt it and then I adapt it. So at the very beginning, it was brought out, how many of you are uh, believe in this, believe in that? And it was very obvious that this entire community was convinced. Right. But yet probably 70% of what you've been telling us is almost a, a wave of, uh, not politicization, because that has a real catch to it, but to try to um, encourage or make it. So we're there. We're there. Now, we need, now wait a minute, because this gentleman with his homeowners, I came here with a friend from our community. We have a little electricity committee. When you talk to them, well, we haven't had to do much of anything. They're not here now. But if we, if this could be a workshop where there's a group over there that is communities, mm -hmm. like ours, there's a group over here that are individual homes, and there's models for that, there's a model for this, there's a farm here where you've got a lot of land and a lot of uh, buildings, maybe you even have schools and have teachers come and learn about how schools, I don't know, that's getting a bit corporate, but right. you see what I mean. I came here and I wanted to get something to take back to my community. I'm not going back with anything I can take to my community because I can't preach to them. They know I'm a crazy liberal anyway. So they're going to be like, yeah, there goes Kay again. So, yeah. Well, first off, I would answer it this way. There is a political aspect of it because what, we're, what we want to do is prime the ground so that way our city council says, you know what, we want Fort Myers, we want Navy, we want Cape Coral, we want Lehigh to go 100% renewable energy. That's part of the focus. The other one was an individual focus of getting solar for our individual homes, which I think does touch on what your, your small community can do as far as doing that. Now, we weren't set up to be a workshop of, this is what you do, this is step one. That, I do invite everybody to talk to a professional like myself, talk to anybody, talk to Arcadia Power, do something that could do that. This was not designed to be a workshop as far as take this and do for everybody, so. We knew very well that this might attract people that were already pro-solar and wanted to know how to help it in the community and as well individually. Um, that's, we, we always joke about, we're doing these things for the choir, these are the people that are already on board. But, as Clifford said earlier, the important thing is that we promulgate those ideas, we talk to other people, we make known that this is a good direction to go. What we intended, and is what we will be doing, is to survey you and get back and say, what do you need more, how can we help you, etc. Do you want to receive this information? Here's some resource list. So, in a way, I, I, I understand exactly where you're at because if you're ready for implementation, this was not an implementation that was shot. But we will be following up and I think try to get you for what you'd like. Because I think our community would put on a, a night where the, anyone in the community can want to come and they would have a presentation, perhaps not quite as uh, <laughs> like this one, but you know, you've got well, it. I, I actually do presentations and I do speaking events, so we could do something more specific. This was a blanket 
to everybody to make sure you have your options of what you can do. So get in touch with me, I'll come by, we can set up something that's specific to your needs and fill them. Because find a need, fill a need. I'm here for that. Because communities do have common electricity, like, mm -hmm. you know, that, that doesn't have to be built to any one. Right. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, we can tailor for that. Yeah, and. I don't think it's on. on. Okay. And in regards to your comments about what you can take back to your community, one thing that I think that we all need to start looking at is what we all experienced and endured in the aftermath of Irma. If that's not something that you can take back to your community to say, hey, do we want to keep doing this over and over again, or are we going to do something within our own community to make us self-sufficient to where we don't have to rely and wait for LCEC or SPL to get to us when they get to us? Because I know I was without power for more than two weeks. So, you know, in that that, that's huge, you know, especially in, you know, retirement communities where those people need power for health reasons or what have you. You know, it's imperative that we start looking at that in the big picture of how we can make that transition and how important and viable solar and renewable energy is in the state of Florida. And I did that on LCEC's page in the aftermath of RMI. I said, gee, how nice would it be able to walk out and go, ding, back on, you know. So that, if you may, will be able to talk more about um, the solar panels and how they uphold natural disasters, because I know that's a question that probably a lot of people do have, you know, that live here in, you know, natural disaster area. But uh, just, you know, keep that in the back of your mind, and that's something that I would probably, you know, discuss within your group. All right. So um, I'm going to make one quick statement, then I'm going to come to you next. So just as far as the integrity of solar panels, Will they handle a hurricane? Solar panels have to re have to meet the requirements set by Miami Dade Miami Dade County. All right, so that's the standard of handling a Category Five hurricane. So there, if your roof goes, then the panel.